Uh, Matt Chandler, a pastor of the Village Church in Texas, often says this to his congregation. I quote, Your life can change with one phone call. You're not exempt. Have you ever gotten one of those phone calls? The cancer has returned. There was an accident. I'm so sorry to inform you that dot, dot, dot. As a pastor, I have received too many of these phone calls from friends and godly saints who who share their pain, share their experience, and then they ask that infamous question, why? Why did this have to happen? You know, tragedy can strike us anywhere and at any time. And when tragedy strikes, it often does not make sense. Why does the drunk driver live while the godly mother of three young children die? Why do the righteous die young and the wicked live to old age? I mean, has life ever perplexed you? Has ever, have you ever been confused with what you see happening in life? If you have, you're in good company. For King Solomon, the preacher of Ecclesiastes, offers us wisdom to navigate life's most pressing questions in the hopes that we would avoid the extremes and find the blessed balance of living a life pleasing before our God. There's just two points to this morning's message. The first is the blessed balance of the fear of God, the blessed balance of the fear of God. This is a very challenging passage. Uh, in many of the commentaries that I studied, that I've been studying to kind of look at this, help me with this book, uh, several of them just kind of left out this passage. They said, we're just not even going to give you any help on it. Go at it yourself. Uh, it can be confusing. Uh, the first half of chapter 7 is about the blessings of wisdom, the different ways how we can live a better than life, while the second half of chapter 7 is really talking about the limitations of wisdom. Look with me in the text today. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, beginning in verse 15. God's word says, In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Be not overly righteous, and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? He begins with his observation of what he has seen in his vain or brief life. He sees a righteous, godly person, godly people perish while the wicked who continue in their wickedness continuing to prosper and prolong their life. It's kind of a similar observation that Asaph makes in Psalm 73. Uh, when he looked at the wicked prospering and increasing in their riches while he tried to live a righteous life, live a life of honor before the Lord, and he suffered. He said that he was, a, he was tempted to despair until he went into God's house. And he considered the end of the wicked. Asaph in Psalm 73 looked past life under the sun to life over the sun, the one rules who rules over the sun. Solomon offers us a warning here to us. He tells us not to be overly righteous or make yourself too wise. Now, he is not saying that pursuing righteousness is bad. For the rest of the Bible teaches the opposite. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. There are countless places throughout the Bible that encourage the pursuit of righteousness. Solomon is warning his readers not to be self-righteous or to use their righteousness to try and manipulate God for a long life. Remember, your life can change with one phone call. You are not exempt. Your godly, righteous life does not exempt you from tragedy. We can't presume that if we do things in this particular way that we are going to be freed from trial. Friends, there will always be temptation in the human heart for self-righteous entitlement. We may believe that we don't deserve trial or persecution or tragedy because we've lived in a particularly godly way. Now, we may know this intellectually, but when that phone call comes, it is still, we still too often believe that we do not deserve what is on the other end of that call. Lord, I've been faithful to you. 
I've attended church regularly. I've given my money faithfully. I've been faithful to my spouse. I've raised my kids in the fear and admonition of you. Why could you let this happen? Why? I don't understand. Beloved, God makes his son rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. We cannot expect a life free from tragedy because we live in righteousness. God determines the times and the seasons of our life. Even as we looked at last week in this passage, 714, this chapter, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other. To that man may not find out anything. That man may not find out anything that will be after him. God sets the course of our life. He is over life and death. Maybe one small way to protect ourselves from self-righteousness is that when people ask you that, so, that, that often question, how are you doing? It's a question we get all the time. Well, maybe one response would be better than I deserve. Now, you don't have to say that every time, but we should at least think it. We can focus on all the ways that life is unfair, all the ways that life is challenging, or uh, we can look at how God's grace and kindness has sustained and carried us in the midst of the, the trials we're facing today. If you are a Christian, hear me, you are always better than you deserve. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. What we deserve for our sin is death, condemnation, and separation from a holy God. Let us never believe that we can make the opposite true. So for the wages of sin is death, for the wages of righteousness is life. Hear me, as sinners, we cannot be righteous. One sin separates us from righteousness. One lie, one judgmental thought, one angry reaction makes righteousness and life impossible for us. Therefore, God sent Jesus Christ, the righteous, for the unrighteous to bring us to God. 1 Peter 3, 18. Beloved, you are always better than you deserve because of the second half of Romans 6, 23. For the wage of sin is death, but the free gift of God, the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We cannot earn righteousness in life. We can only receive it. God offers eternal life through faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus. It is when we repent, turn from our self-righteousness and our efforts to earn salvation from our own works and submit to Jesus Christ as our Lord. Listen to the end of that verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friend, repent. Repent of your self-righteousness and submit to Jesus as Savior and Lord. For the righteousness he offers is always better than we deserve. The second warning that Solomon offers is, is not to be overly wicked or to, to be a fool. He's not saying just be, be a little wicked or just do a little bad things as long as you avoid the really, really bad things. He's warning his readers not to kind of give up and give themselves to sin when strategy strikes. You know, sometimes we, we, we think we experience tragedy and we see godly people suffer and, we're, and we throw up our hands and say, well, if this happened to them, they are a godly, righteous person. Well, what's the point? Why do I even bother? They're more righteous than me and this happened to them. Why do I even care? And they kind of give themselves to sin. Maybe you've had a situation in your own life, maybe a season where you kind of said, I'm going to be faithful to the Lord. I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to be more faithful to the church. And then the desired outcome you want in your life doesn't happen. This may have led you to despair. And oftentimes it turns you back towards sin. If I worked hard to be righteous and that didn't work, why did I just live in sin? It doesn't matter anyway. Do you see the dangers of these two extremes? The twin dangers of legalism on the one hand and licentiousness or wild living has always been in the human heart. Solomon offers how we overcome these extremes with an exhortation of something he's already said, something he will say throughout this book. Look at verse 18. It is good that you should take hold of this, 
and from that withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. It is the fear of God that allows you to overcome self-righteousness. And it is the fear of God that allows you to overcome sinful resignation. When we live in the fear of God, we do not try to live to earn an easy life or to earn a long life through our good works, but we live for the pleasure of our Creator. We live not for our, to earn earthly blessings, but to live in the hope of eternal joy. When we live in the fear of God, we do not give ourselves to wickedness because we know that one day every deed we do in this life, good and evil, will be held to an account before a holy God. Friends, we do not live for life under the sun, but to the, for the one who live, rules over the sun. To live in the fear of God is to live quorum Deo, before the face of God. Now remember that Solomon offers the fear of God as a solution to what he sees in life. There's a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. There's a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Notice that Solomon does not explain why the righteous die young or why the wicked prolong their life. He does not explain it because he can't fully explain it. Human wisdom has limits. One of the recurring kind of themes in the second half of the book of Ecclesiastes is that is how man cannot find out what comes after him. We see this at the end of chapter uh, 6. It says, for who could tell a man what will uh, be after him after the sun? Uh, we see the same thing in, in verse 14 I just read. This, they may not be able to find out anything that may be after him. We see the same thing in our, in our text this morning in verses 23 and 24. It says, all this I have tested by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been so is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? But what Solomon is saying here is that human wisdom does not give you the full story. It leaves you with holes or it's limited. I cannot fully figure out life. Beloved, your life can change with one phone call. You are not exempt. You know, I have sat with grieving widows and widowers, parents and children as they've gotten those awful phone calls of the death of a loved one. I've cried with dear brothers and sisters as they've gotten phone calls of test results and received the timeline of the length of their days. And they all want to know why. Solomon is trying to help us before we get that phone call by saying, we don't know. There are limits to human wisdom. We may not fully understand this side of attorney, why things happen as they do. But what he's saying is that we can deal with them with the fear of the Lord. We don't give up on God. We don't try to manipulate him. We trust him. We do not know our future, but we know who holds our future. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 11, these words are helpful to us, 11, 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For he, for who has known the mind of the Lord, who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Listen, friends, when we do not understand life, let us trust God. His ways are inscrutable. His judgments are unsearchable. But he is God. He is the creator. He is good, compassionate, patient, loving. And he will carry us through all the phone calls we get in this life. The second point, the blessed balance of humble honesty. The blessed balance of humble honesty. Solomon wants to, us to help see that there are limits to human wisdom. And yet, understanding our limitations help us live in wisdom. It's, it's, it's but when we understand how little we actually know, that's when we tend to live the best. Look at verse 19. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than 10 rulers who are in a city. 
It is clear that Solomon wants us to see the strength that wisdom offer, even in its limitations. The wisdom that Solomon is going to draw out towards the end of this passage specifically wants us to see that all humanity is sinful. There is wisdom in understanding the depravity of man. If we are honest with ourselves and with our sin, we will develop humility. And humility is the very essence of wisdom. It is admitting that you don't know everything and you have to submit to another, that God is the creator, that God is the sovereign one, and we are mere creatures. But the depravity of man is not just a doctrine that we, that we hold to understand the world. It's a doctrine that actually helps us live very practically. See, theology drives practice. Every area of life, every ideology in our world is driven by a particular theology. Secular humanism undergirds much of popular American thought. It teaches the belief that humanity is capable of morality. It's capable of of being good or have self-fulfillment without a belief in God. Now, the Bible strongly, strongly disagrees with secular humanism. The Bible teaches that all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. There is not capacity in humanity for morality and goodness without God. Solomon says it very clearly in verse 20. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. This is what Simeon read in Romans chapter 3, 9. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. The reason our world is broken is because of sin. We are broken individually because of sin. We are broken as a society because of sin. Sin is the core problem in our world. Why is there discontent in your life? Sin. Why is there relational friction or brokenness in your family? Sin. Why is there ethnic oppression? Sin. Why is there slander and anger? Sin. Listen, I want to improve society. I want our society to improve. I want people to treat one another with kindness and civility. I want structures that are designed to oppress people to be changed. I want laws in our country that protect the weakest and most vulnerable among us. But I do not believe that society will change until sin is addressed. We are missing the root problem, and if we miss the root problem, we will miss the root solution. It's like someone who's walking long distance but can't, has shortness of breath. Now, the reason is because they have, they have lung cancer, and yet what the solution to the problem is, is you need to get better shoes. Until we get the right diagnosis, we will always end up with the wrong solution. As Christians, we must always approach everything in life with a robust biblical framework. We need to address sin. And if we address sin, we have to address the sinful hearts where it comes from. Solomon looks at our world and says it's broken because of sin. And then he provides this incredibly practical wisdom in light of the depravity of man. Look at verse 21 and 22. Do not take to heart all the things that people say. Sometimes you wish there was a period there, right? Let me say that again. Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. Don't take to heart all the things that people say. Don't listen to everything you hear. Why? It's because people are sinners and people are going to say sinful things. You know, I was on Twitter uh, earlier this week and I was so thankful that I was not well known, that I am not well known. You know, I don't have a large Twitter following and I don't think anyone goes to Twitter or Facebook to find out what Pastor Dave Keene is thinking about this particular issue. But it's shocking to me how many people curse others online, especially those who are well-known or have a position of influence, condemning, judgmental, arrogant, sinful attacks were in abundance. Solomon would say, don't take it to heart. 
People will curse you because people are sinners. But you and I don't need a large Twitter following to to have people criticize us and to curse us in their hearts. If you have people in your life, there are probably going to be a day when people are going to curse you. Now, it may be under their breath, it may be in their heart, or it may be to your face. But people are going to curse you. Why? Because people are sinners. So I want to be a good pastor. I want to love people well. But I know that there is no way I can care for everyone in the church the way they want to be cared for. I can't love everyone the way they want to be loved. If 90% or 95% feel like things are going great, they, they trust the leadership of the elders and they feel like they're being loved by their pastors, I still don't know there's, there's 5 to 10% who struggle with the decisions that are being made. So how do you deal with criticism, whether at your job or in your own home? I think what Solomon is trying to, trying to tell you, you deal with criticism by understanding the depravity of the human heart. First, you understand that people will sin against you. And when they sin against you, you shouldn't be surprised. Second, you understand that you will sin against people. And you have sinned against people. Look what the text says. It's interesting. Um, It says, verse 22, your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. Isn't that interesting? We feel like we're attacked one time and we want to throw the gauntlet down and start defending ourselves. And Solomon's like, oh, by the way, many times you have done the same. Do not be surprised when people curse you, Solomon says, for many times you have cursed others. And listen, if people knew all my sins, if people knew all your sins, the criticism would be far worse. And yet the one who knows it all, who knows all our junk, all the bad things that we've done, all the bad thoughts we've had, loves me and loves you in spite of it all. This is what Grant, yet, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So be merciful when people sin against you. For God was merciful when you sinned against him. Listen, beloved, I do not want us to be a church known for cursing others. We do not want to be a church that is known for responding harshly when people curse us. It is sinful. We want to be a church that has honest humility and understanding that our fallenness is real and we desperately need a Savior. We want to be a church that has honest humility, understanding the fallenness and brokenness of others in our lives and treat them with the grace of and mercy we have received from God. Do not deny your sin. If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. Confess your sin and admit it. Listen, we are all broken sinners in this place. For surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Listen, we have to be honest when we struggle. If we are not going to be honest with one one another, then we don't understand the depravity that's in our own heart. We confess it. We don't justify ourselves. Too many times we we add the because or the but to our apology. That's not really confessing. It's justifying. Listen, we all are sinners. We're all broken. Therefore, we all need grace. If you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, Have you ever been honest with yourself about your sin? Have you ever come to grips with what your sin deserves? We all have a sin problem. Our sin problem is not just our brokenness with one another, but our brokenness with God. God is righteous, and God cannot allow anyone in his presence who is unrighteous. We all need righteousness if we want to be with God in heaven. See, our sin problem is, is really a righteousness problem. The good news is that God sent Jesus Christ, the righteous, to deal with our unrighteousness. Jesus lived a perfect, righteous life, and he willingly laid down his life, humbling himself to the point of death on a cross. He was dead and buried, but God raised him from the dead. And now, today, the resurrection is God's sign to the world that sinners can be made righteous again not by their good works, not by anything they can do, but by the work of Christ on their behalf, through faith. 
Paul taught this to the church at Philippi, that we need to forsake life here with the hope of the rights that, that God gives. Listen to Philippians chapter 3, 8 through 11. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For this sake, for his sake, I have suffered loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Hear me, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. What Paul is saying here, you can't have righteousness by what you do. You can't earn God's favor by doing good things. It's impossible because we're sinners. We need a righteousness that is outside of ourselves. He says, but a righteousness that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Friend, let me plead with you. If you are in your sin, repent. Forsake all and follow Jesus Christ by faith and receive a righteousness from above given by the hand of God so that you may attain the resurrection from the dead. If you're here and you're listening and you are not a Christian, know this. Just because you have a Christian friend or you're part of a, a Christian group doesn't mean that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. The only way you're going to be safe in death is you have righteousness. And that righteousness only comes through Christ. Listen, an honest humility brings balance to our life. It helps us understand that when we sin and others sin against us, we have a framework for that in understanding the human depravity. But it also warns us that we, because we are sinful, can fall into the trap of the evil one. Look at verses 25 through 29. I turn my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and the scheme or sum of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. And I find something more bitter than death, the woman whose heart is, is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Behold, this is what I have found, says the preacher, while adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have found, I have not found. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. See, this alone I found that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Really what Solomon's doing here, he's kind of reiterating the point. He's a good communicator. He says the same thing repeatedly. We are sinners and in danger of falling into the trap of folly. As Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 9, that there's, there's two women calling aloud. There's the, the voice of wisdom saying, come and follow me. And the voice of Father says, come in here, follow me. If you do not understand your own depravity and sinful desires, you may fall into her trap. All of us are susceptible. It is only the one who pleases God escapes her folly. It means the only one who lives to please the Lord who's honoring by his word and is, is, is honest before God that escapes the traps of the evil one. He says he searched out the schemes of things. As I said when I read it, the, the sum of things also could be said in Hebrew. He searched to understand life, and guess what? I have not found. He doesn't have all the answers. There's, there's li limitations to his wisdom. But he's found sinful people. That's what he's found. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. It's really a prophetic, poetic way of saying is that righteousness is rare. It's rare to find righteousness in life. He ends by saying this, this summary statement. This alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. God made man good, but we have fallen into sin. Beloved, do not underestimate sin. Do not underestimate your sinful desires. Do not, do, do not underestimate the sin that is in your own heart and in the hearts of others. Sin wants to trap you. 
The way we overcome sin is by having an honest humility about our condition. Yes, for those of us who are in Christ today, we are redeemed from sin. Amen? We have the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And yet, as long as we are in this flesh, we are in danger. We are susceptible to sin. Know your limitations. Confess your sin. Bring it to the light. When sin is confessed, let us encourage one another with the, with the gospel, forgiveness, and mercy. This past week, a, a friend of mine reached out to me to confess sin. He said, I need, need to tell you that, uh, that I sinned this past week. Well, what did I do? Did I scold him? Did I condemn him? No. What I told him is that in Christ, your sin is forgiven. In Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ sings over you, justified. Justified. There is no one who can condemn you because there is nothing in all, all of life that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Forgiven, blameless, holy. Believe the gospel. Now, can you imagine the kind of church we would be when we confessed sin to one another and we didn't get cursing and condemnation, but we got grace and mercy? What kind of place would we be? What kind of people would we be? Finally, let me exhort you with Ephesians chapter 6, 10, and 11 as I close. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Beloved, we are weak, but we are strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are schemers, but with the whole armor of God, we are able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We are sinners, but we are made righteous in Christ and in Christ alone. Never lose the blessed balance of our weakness and God's redemptive power. And when your life changes with that phone call, when tragedy strikes you, you need to know that by God's grace, you will never have to face that trial alone because you are never alone. As the great hymn of the faith says, though Satan should buffet, though trials shall come, lest this blessed assurance control that Christ, Christ has regarded our helpless estate and he has shed his own blood for our soul. Beloved, it is well. Father, we thank you that by your grace it is well with our soul. God, we thank you that by your shed blood, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we who were unrighteous have been made righteous in your eyes, that we are forgiven, justified, and holy because of your grace and your mercy. God, we pray that we would understand our own frailty. We understand our limitations. But, oh God, I pray that all of us here would lean hard upon your grace and know that you and by you alone we are forgiven and made right with you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This last song.